Hi, I'm Michael Short from WASP Pro, bringing you another episode of Profiles. And today we are super lucky because we have special guest Steven Reinstein joining us from Market Muscles. And so I'm super anxious to hear what he's done, how he got to where he is, a little bit about his tech stack and his philosophy behind creating his WAS. So uh, please, let's uh, welcome Steven to the show. Um, you know, my name is Steven Reinstein. I run a company called Market Muscles. And, you know, just popping into the WAS group was kind of mind opening for me just to see, um, you know, so many people running these sorts of companies. So I'm, I'm excited to chat with you today. Awesome, man. I'm glad to have you here. Um, so there's, we have so many questions. I know the group has been super excited to hear that uh, I'm going to be doing this interview. I talked to a few people that on the side and said, hey, yeah, I'm going to be talking to them. So they had a couple of questions they want me to ask you. And uh, I, first, I wanted to start with like, how did you get started with WAS? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, it's funny. Like, first of all, I've just heard of this term, like, <laughs> when I found your group. So um, I didn't even know it was a thing. But uh, I created Market Muscles with my wife about three years ago. And um, I've been a lifelong martial artist. And that's the type of clients that we serve right now, our martial arts clients. Um, so I've kind of seen, you know, from their perspective, from, from a martial arts school perspective, what type of things that they needed. And I've also always done websites and marketing. I started when I was 12 or 13, just kind of dabbling with design and coding. And I've worked for a ton of different agencies kind of over the years and, you know, just kind of decided to combine my passion for martial arts with my experience with creating websites. And then my wife, who's, um, you know, really into marketing and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was just kind of like a culmination of that. And it's been about three years or so since we've, we've had, or started the company. Oh, wow. Very nice. So there's just the two of you or do you have like, it seems like you have a full group though, right? Working for you now. Yeah. So we have, um, including some of our overseas helpers, 15 people in total. Um, so it's kind of grown over time. Like when we first started the business, it was just us two for a pretty long time because, uh, we didn't get a customer for maybe two or three months after we actually started the business. It took some time. Um, and you know, I, I think that's to be kind of expected, right? Because we were kind of new to the industry, even though I was part of it from a like practitioner standpoint, I wasn't part of the business side of it, which is very different. Um, so to kind of make my way through that side of the business was very difficult. And it took a lot of sharing and being part of the community without any expectation of getting anything back and just really becoming an asset to the community. Um, so it took about two or three months before we actually got our first client and we got our first client right before we went to our first trade show. And, um, you know, my wife was kind of doing research to figure out all the different martial arts business related trade shows that we could potentially go to in the future. We had no expectations of going to any until, you know, we, we kind of picked up some clients, but there was one, the largest one called the Martial Arts Super Show, which is in Vegas every single year um, in July. And I think it was like, we, we launched the company in May. Um, and then we saw that there was this thing in July. And then I was kind of speaking with the, one of the people that helped run it. And they're like, hey, we have one booth left. You guys want to come? And we're like, yeah, that sounds great. And I remember specifically the booth cost us around $2,000. We didn't have the money to do it. I remember putting the cost of the booth on like multiple credit cards split because it was just like, you know, we weren't making any money yet. We, we had one client, literally one client. Um, so we just took a risk and went and we actually ended up being set up right next to what is now one of our main competitors in the industry. So we're this brand new company in this tiny little dinky booth next to this giant booth of this company that's been you know, serving thousands of martial arts schools or whatever they do. Um, but we walked away from that experience with a lot of knowledge and we signed up like five or six clients at the, the Super Show, which was really big for us because we were a, a nobody company. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how all things got started. But it was probably a year to a year and a half before we actually started bringing on, on staff because it took a, a long time to kind of scale up to where we're at now. Oh, nice. Well, yeah, you have to start somewhere, right? So, yeah. yeah. As far as what you guys launched when you first launched, is it? Is I know that what you have now is super beautiful. Um, was there a different iteration of it in your beginning, or have you? Is this what you've always had? 
from the food. Yeah, it was a different version. Um, it was a lot. I mean, our systems now compared to what it was before are so different. Uh, we were pretty much just setting up individual WordPress websites. And the reason why we did that is I had a friend that had a WAS company as well, but he served churches and okay. he was using Beaver Builder. And this was four years ago uh, or so, or three and a half years ago. Um, and he was doing multi-site and I never asked why, but he told me to not do multi-site. I, oh, right. I still don't have a good reasoning for why not to. Uh, I, I think there's some things that I'm sure there's advantages to doing it one way or another, but um, just he was running a company already that he served churches and he was doing it on a multi-site and he said, Hey, I, I don't suggest it. So I just kind of said, Oh, okay. All right. So we won't do that. Um, but, um, but yeah, we were just doing like individual installations. We just kind of had a template or a theme that I created just having the knowledge of how to create WordPress websites. And we were just duplicating that for every site essentially that we were building. Um, we have some like add-on features as well that were kind of unique to us, but I think in the beginning we were really trying to be everything because we saw what everyone else was offering and we felt like we had to offer that as well to be relevant. So we were doing like social media stuff, we were doing managed Facebook ads, we were doing um, just tons of different like marketing stuff, landing pages, just everything you can think of. We were trying to like just jam it into what we offer. We still offer a lot of that, but it's kind of different now because it's at a scale where we can manage it a lot better. But um, yeah, I mean, those that beginning time, the first iteration of our website stuff, we don't look like what it looks like now. Our systems are way different. We've been through so many challenges throughout the process when it comes to like servers and hacked websites and all these different things that like, I, I feel like we're, I mean, I'm sure there's still tons for us to learn, but we've got it pretty dialed in now. Yeah, it looks like it, I would say. Um, so you're saying that your system now is still not multi-site? Or did you No, not not multi-site. Yeah. So uh, we're all in individual installation still, which but but it's it's different because we have all of the data coming to a central source. Because we our websites are built specifically for lead generation. So there's a lot of features behind just the website itself that our uh, customers find, you know, help them with running their business. So lead management. Um, email and text message sequences, communicating with their leads, stuff like that. We've now built like a core system where all of the data, even though they're individual sites, it all ends up coming back to one database pretty much. So um, it's like we've built our own multi-site system, I guess. If that yeah, your own SaaS product almost sounds like too. Yes, yeah. I've always thought of us more of a SaaS business. I actually kind of thought we were between a SaaS company and then like an agency, but I never understood where we really fit into that. <laughs> And then I found WAS and I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's what <laughs> Now you're just kicking WAS, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's awesome. So as far as like the, the uh, services that you used to provide and you scaled it back, what were some of the challenges that you experienced? Why would you have scaled those things back? Yeah, I, I think anytime you're going to introduce a new feature, you need to think about it from not just building the feature, but supporting it also, which is like mm -hmm. one of the big yeah. things that I always have difficulty seeing not so much anymore but i would before because i would get really excited about it so like for instance um when we found out about elementor like a year and a half ago or so and we were like this is amazing it's inexpensive we can add landing page building functionality to all of our clients websites um i thought it was amazing and i was able to do it in like a day like rolled out to everybody but what i didn't think about is all the questions we're going to get now on creating landing pages or do we create landing pages for our clients or do we just guide them on how to do it or what type of knowledge base do you need to be able to support that? So that's like one of the things now that I'm very uh, aware of. And then anytime you make announcements of a new feature, you should expect to like have a ton of questions and be able to answer that. So typically what we do now is anything new that we release, we do a scaled rollout or we'll just release it for like 10 clients let them use it, figure out how it's working, what we have to do to support it, and then just kind of increase the user base based on that. Actually, let me ask you that. that what's your, the process that you have for setting up your website in regards to, like, do you let them design it or do you start from a template that they choose from? What does that look like? Yeah, so we have three template options. All of the copy is pre-written for our clients, but we have the option for them to go in and change some if they want to. The way that we set it up is it, it's like an override. So if they put in content, it replaces ours. But if they take it out, it'll go back to ours, mm -hmm. which is good because if they edit the content and then decide they don't like it, you don't have to go back in and then 
repaste in the content because they don't remember what it was in the first place. Mm -hmm. So having that fallback is really helpful. But yeah, a couple different template options, all per in content, and then it's all customizable from there. So that's where advanced custom fields has come in really handy because we can set things up where they can upload their own images in certain places. Uh, we can very simply change out the logo, colors, things like that without doing any CSS or any sort of like major customization. So it was built uh, up front to be very extensible because each one of the websites that we create, it's on the same template, but we still create custom graphics and background images um, and match the color of their logo and do all these kind of customizations for them when we create their site. So it's like everyone's kind of getting their own customized version of it. Um, do they get an opportunity to add sections and things that are not existing on the template themselves? Or is that something they go through you for? Uh, yeah, so it depends on which page they're editing um, because there's always a balance because we have to remember our customers aren't marketing professionals as well. So if we give them too much control to change stuff, then they end up with something that's not what it was supposed to be, essentially, or not as effective as it could have been. So we do give them the opportunity to change things, but we're just pretty selective about what those things are. That's smart. Yeah, that, we're kind of the same way in that respect. We don't uh, give them too much control. In fact, I don't know if you've seen some of the plugins that were created, like Live Editor. That uh -huh. We just recently installed that on ours, and it makes more sense to just really limit how much people actually have access to. And yeah, you found that um, they don't really want to make that many changes to their site. Like, they just want to change some of the content, and that's it. Yeah, I think everyone kind of has, like, their select things that they want to change. Um, you know, we have a full-time support desk because with our clientele, and I'm sure this is the same with a lot of other industries, they're so busy focusing on their business, they don't want to have to manage their site as well, which is why they hire a WAS company. So if they are changing their special on their site or if they want to post a blog or something like that, of course, they can log in and do it themselves. But I think it's smart to have a team there because it might be easier for them to just email you and then you take care of it. Um, so yeah, I think that some clients, they like to control, they like to be able to do things themselves just because that's the type of person they are. And then there's some clients that they don't even want to touch it. They just want to have someone take care of it and, and not have to worry about it at all because they're so busy with other things. So I think there's, there's typically a mixed group of people. Would you say it's 50, 50, or do you find that you get one more than the other? Um, probably more people that don't want to touch the website than do, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, usually it's like the people that like technology that like the option to go in and do stuff. But with the, at least my demographic being a little bit older, a lot of them feel like they're just going to break it if they touch it. So they just prefer not to. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you promote your site. All right. Yeah, your service. Like, and you mentioned in the beginning you did the trade show, but is there other stuff? Are you doing Facebook ads? Are you doing cold calling? What are some of the things you're doing? Just giving you uh, the most success. Yeah, we don't do anything really, which oh, really? might be surprising. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't do any marketing. Like we go to trade shows, which is pretty much it. But really what it's been is like sweat equity in terms of getting really involved with the community and being uh, a part of it before when offering you, services. When you say the community, are we talking on like Facebook or do you? is there some like special meetups or something that you get a part of? Yeah, um, Facebook mostly Yeah, has been the, the best source for us. There's a lot of different business Facebook groups for the, the niche that we we service. So just going in there and, and I see it too. It's like there's a lot of people that go in and try to go that route too and it comes off very un, unauthentic because mm -hmm. they know that they're trying to help with Facebook ads or something. So they'll go in there and they'll start a discussion and say some sort of question regarding Facebook ads. But really what they're doing is they're just starting to you know, make some sort of discussion topic so then they can go eventually approach these people and sell to them. Whereas I found that just joining in on existing conversations was really helpful. I also did this thing that a, a friend of mine recommended where I would set up um, these things that I called lightning talks. So I'd take one day of the week and I would allow anybody to book a 15 minute consultation with me about any question regarding website, social media, anything that could help their business really. And just, do it for free just to kind of connect with people. So I do those a lot in the beginning as well. Um, and that helped me make a lot of connections, but really our growth is from word of mouth, uh, for the most part. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So that talks that you're talking about, you just posted up in the group. Is that how you get those initiated or do you have your own group or is it other groups that you're a part of? How does, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, it's both. So I do have my own group and then, um, there is other groups that I'm part of as well. 
And at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm not being egotistical or cocky. I'm kind of like established in the industry now. So um, I don't have to be as like aggressive with my contributions, I guess, if that makes sense. Because yeah, totally. the business kind of has its own reputation now. But mm-hmm. initially, like I was on Facebook all the time, contributing, talking, chatting, doing whatever I can to really um, just connect with people. I did do a lot of Facebook ads and stuff in the beginning, but nothing ever was like that uh, that good, I guess, in terms of conversions and stuff like that. Yeah, I think really the best way is just to establish connections with people because people only want to do business with people that they trust, right? And, yeah, no like and trust, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So by running a Facebook ad, like, yeah, you get to get in front of people, but it's not as strong as actually creating relationships with people. Yeah, and speaking of which, do you still go to trade shows and do that as well, or are you done, done with that? No, we still go to trade shows. Um, there's a couple that we'll go to every year. So the Super Show is kind of like our staple. So we do that, um, which we just had this past July. So we're kind of, um, you know, just winding down from the craziness that that, that brings to us. Um, I speak at a lot of these trade shows as well, which is good um, for definitely like establishing us. For me, it's not like my passion though, in terms of speaking. So um, it takes a lot of effort for me to like prepare and get ready and, and, and feel good about it, but it's worth it because to get on a stage and be in front of hundreds or thousands of people and be able to deliver some sort of value to them is really tremendous for the business. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a couple of different ones that we'll go to every February. We go to a, a smaller one. It's about 60 or so school owners in, uh, Cozumel, Mexico. It's like everyone just flies there for, for the event. Um, there's one in Florida that we typically go to, but really the big one that we, we always go to is the one in Vegas in July. And where are you guys located again? You're on the East coast, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're in Virginia. Yeah. And our team is distributed. So we've got some people that are local and then it's like split half and half or half the team is, is around the United States. Um, one in California, one in Florida, one in Oklahoma, one in Texas. Um, and then we've got some people local in our office as well. Mm, very cool. Now let's talk about your pricing model. How did you come up with that? Where did that come from? So our pricing model has changed quite a bit. Um, when we first started the company, our monthly subscription rate was one seventy nine, I think. Where now we charge two ninety nine, and the one seventy nine um, was just for the website. And then we kind of had all these like add on packages, like I was talking about before, when we were trying to do everything. Um, eventually, we kind of continued to raise our pricing until it got to two nineteen, and then we had four add on services that were sixty seven dollars each, just different like social media graphics, uh, just different things that we were offering. Um, and then what we decided to do is kind of combine it all together and go like the base camp route or maybe they combined everything into one service and it was just a flat fee, two ninety nine. dollars It got really confusing, like tracking who had access to what. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and we also found that the people that were using more of these add-on uh, features were getting better results anyway. So it just mm-hmm. made sense for us to kind of roll it all into a one one uh, price package for everything. So now we just refer to it as like a marketing suite, which is $2.99 a month. Uh, Every time that we raised our price, we didn't adjust our previous clients. So we kind of grandfathered them in, but we did also increase the services that they got. So there are some people like our first client that we ever signed up is still with us. They're paying $1.79 a month and they get access to everything that someone who's paying $2.99 right now gets to. That's just kind of like our, our thing though. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, it'd be hard to like raise their price and after they've been loyal to you. Um, right. Yeah. Now, how did the, was there any resistance in your raising of your prices? Like, did you notice a downfall in sales or anything like that? No? Not at all. I think the only resistance came from when people would refer someone to us and then we would tell them the pricing and then they would say, oh, but my friend is paying two nineteen a month. And then we're honest with them. We say, okay, well, yeah, that's because he signed up six months ago and you know, now this is our pricing. We combined all of our services, which you're going to get. And we've never had anyone kind of like push back on that. Um, I think people appreciate the fact that we stick to our word of grandfathering people and not raising their rates. And, and um, just that alone kind of gives them confidence that, yeah, today they might be signing up for two ninety nine, but maybe down the road we raise our prices to three twenty five a month or something like that. And they're not going to have to to deal with that where other companies in our industry do do that to their customers. So um yeah we haven't had really any major pushback on that 
Uh, based on some of the services that you provide, the other services, how hands-on are they? Do you have like a team or staff that has to handle them individually? Like let's say social media stuff, things like that. Or do you outsource it or is your system more of an, like an automated thing where they just can plug in their information and it kind of runs itself? Um, yeah, so it depends. Um, so the email and text message marketing, which is one of the add-ons or it comes with their, their services now, we already have all the content pre-written. So when we set up their site, we have a system that does the email and text message sequences. So we just import the, the sequences that are relevant to the programs that they offer and it works just fine. So there's not really too much to do there. It's part of the setup process now. Um, and then some of the other pieces like social media. So social media management, we do sell as an add-on because that's a lot more intensive. So um, that piece we have uh, kind of like a partnership with another company that offers those services. It's just a lot of our clients want to have a one-stop shop for things. So mm. rather than us building out a team to run social media ads and then being kind of responsible for that as a service, because it is, you know, obviously there's tons of agencies that do that as their sole purpose. We kind of just partnered with someone so that way they could provide that service, which has helped us a lot. Um, yeah, but everything else is pretty much built into our systems now where it's not too much of a, an extra burden on us. Yeah, that's good because then you can scale. That was like main, my main concern because some of those services I saw on your site look like, you know, it just means you have to add more in manpower. But if you have that outsourcing, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's, let, I think we pretty much covered a lot of the good stuff that I want to talk about. But if, let's talk to like the person that is starting their own WAS. Like how, what would you recommend uh, to them now that you've gone through this entire process and you've made some iterations and all of that stuff? Is there anything that you would have done differently? Uh, no, uh, no? Definitely okay. not. no I, I think that failure is a big part of growth. And if you don't fail, then you're not going to be able to grow. So um, I don't think I would do any. Yeah, I mean, like, of course, in hindsight, like it would have been nice to avoid certain situations. Like mm -hmm. one time we had a server that just went down and it took like three or four days to get back up. So our clients' mm -hmm. websites were down for a pretty sizable amount of time. But because of that, we're now on like one of the best, like we used DigitalOcean, we have like incredible caching set up where if things do go down, the sites still show for the public. We have like load balancers put in place. So that way if we do get hit by a ton of traffic, it just, you know, gets distributed between multiple servers. So we're now in a much better position where if that never happened, we'd still be in a vulnerable position and eventually it would have happened anyway. So I think making mistakes and figuring out those sorts of things are really important to creating a successful business. So I personally wouldn't change anything, but for the person that's starting out, um, my suggestion would be to not focus or don't get too caught up in the actual like building of the WAS business and like your own personal website. And the, like, I, I think it's really easy to get hung up in like what you think is important stuff right now, like how well your website is set up to show off your services, where in reality you could have a very simple landing page that, just says what you do and what the pricing is, and that's all you really need to get started. Um, so I would say just start doing quicker, start making mistakes quicker, because that means you'll get to the, the good stuff quicker as well. And would you say also start establishing yourself in the marketplace, like within your niche, like as quick as possible as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely what has always worked for us. It's just, yeah. just kind of get integrated as much as possible as a regular person, not as a service provider, but as you as a person. Yeah. Do you offer a referral program or anything like that for your existing customers that encourages them to refer other? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a bonus. We'll, we'll give a free month to whoever refers a customer, but most of our referrals don't come because of that. It's mostly because we offer a good service. So then they refer people which is like a good scenario to be in. So yeah, we offer that program, but like I'd say probably 60% of the time we don't even, not because we don't want to give the, the free month, but because we don't, we never even hear from the person who signs up. Oh, this person referred me or whatever. So people aren't out there actively looking to get free months. So they're referring people. They just refer people because we do really good work and they like it and it works for them. And then as a bonus, you know, if they mention it, then we'll give them a free month. Yeah. So you don't advertise it. You just, um, if they mention it, then you give it to them. Got it. Yep. Awesome, man. I, I learned a lot from you. I think this has been great. I appreciate all the time that you spent. Um, is there anything that you might want to add that we haven't covered? I mean, I don't want to take up all your morning. So, um, 
No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, if there's any questions, hopefully, uh, I'm not sure how you'll post this, but if there's a place where people can post comments and stuff like that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of the, the WAS community now on Facebook and to see so many people kind of going that route. I think it's the, the smartest way possible. Um, I always tell people to just niche down. I always see like when things pop up, um, I, don't, I don't even know what the most recent one was, but it was some sort of provider where you can go in and really, you know, create quick WordPress websites and someone posted it and was like, Oh, I'm going to give up now. And I think it's, it's crazy uh, to, to have that sort of mentality because um, you know, these kind of vague website as a service providers like Squarespace and Wix, they cater to a very specific type of person. And it's, it's, you just have to remember that if someone signs up for that service, they need to build their site themselves still. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So just niche down, you know, provide a really hands-on service that's going to make sure that it makes a impact on their business without them having to do a lot. And uh, I'm sure everyone will have a lot of customers. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm cool. glad. Thank, thank you for, for being on this uh, profile with me. I totally appreciate your time. Um, sure. And I look forward to staying connected with you in the group. Awesome. Uh, appreciate it. All right. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon. All right.